Hi, welcome to South Florida Art Salon. This is a new season and a new name and um, a lot of exciting, to me, changes that I hope are exciting to a lot of other people. Um, I have felt for the longest time that the artists in South Florida deserved a lot more recognition than they were getting. And naming the art salons, South Florida art salons is one step, I hope, in uh, doing my part to help to make that happen. In the last year, we have been joined by Dani Tapia, who is really well known in South Florida for uh, going to art studios, art openings, uh, artist talks, getting to know just about everybody in the art world in South Florida. And she's been writing about that in her Instagram page, which is Art Scenes 365, uh, almost daily. And so I was delighted when she approached me and said that she'd like to be involved. And she's been the moderator for the discussions that follow our art salons for a year now. Um, and I'm really happy to have her on board. So our speaker tonight, um, to go back to Danny Tapia for one moment, I usually know the artists who are invited to speak at Art Salon and invite them myself. This time, Danny suggested that we invite Jared McGriff, who she knew and I didn't. I did know his work. I had seen a solo exhibition of his at the NSU Fort Lauderdale Art Museum that I was very impressed with. And uh, hi, Jared, he's here. <laughs> All right. um, and I had seen his work in the South Florida Consortium exhibition that was at FAU last year. Um, he was one of the winners of the South Florida Consortium. And I thought, who is this man that I did not know and who's doing this wonderful work and getting so much recognition for it. Um, and then he won the Florida Prize at the Orlando Museum. And we went up to see that exhibit. And again, the work was wonderful, um, very moving, very personal, um, very compelling. And, uh, but I hadn't met him. I go to a lot of openings and somehow we hadn't met. Um, and when Danny suggested that he be asked to speak, I said, sure, go right ahead. So he's with us tonight and I'm really happy about that. Um, Jared was born and raised in California and uh, has been, it sounds like an artist all his life. He's been mostly drawing and he'll tell you all about that. Um, but his life took a very different turn professionally for quite a few years. And he got a bachelor's degree in architecture from uh, University of California at Berkeley and a master's degree in um, finance at an MBA at NYU. And I believe he worked in the financial field for a lot of years. Um, I'm sure drawing and looking at art through all that time. And uh, returned to the art world full time and has just, his career has taken off. It, recognition is happening all over. Um, he's represented by Spinello Projects, one of the top galleries in Miami. And uh, they have an international reputation. And uh, so here he is tonight, Jared McGriff. Welcome. Thanks, Ellie. Um, appreciate that that intro, and, and thanks for the invite. Um, it's always good to to speak with people who are are interested in um, in seeing work and who appreciate painting. So uh, I'm glad I have the chance to speak with you um, and your audience today, uh, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, in terms of um, what I wanted to talk about, I think. Um, I'm just going to go through go through some images and kind of explain um, a, a bit about my practice through um, through the images that have influenced my my practice 
Um, and then I'll, of course, share, um, share some work um, and uh, paintings uh, that have, have been exhibited in, um, in some of the shows that, um, that Ellie mentioned um, and, and then kind of talk about my studio, like what's going on in the studio now. So um, the, the title of, of the talk is Capturing Moments to Memory and Imagination. And I, I wanted to use this title because that's, that's really kind of a, a one-line statement about my practice. My practice is all based on memory and imagination. So the, the work that I focus on is, is really not about using references to create images, but instead using my memory and imagination to create images. And I focus a lot on imagined portraits and imagined landscapes. And I kind of create these environments based on my visual memory, which I, I have this first section that kind of explains what that comes from. Um, so when I think about vision and I think about seeing work, of course, I, I think about what the word means, vision, in, in the first place. And I think about how, you know, there's kind of two ways uh, of seeing things. There's this ability to see in terms of um, seeing the, the physical world around us. And then there's also this ability to use our, our vision to imagine and essentially see what isn't around us and to create, you know, a, a picture of something in, in our minds that's of our own making. And I think that's super interesting. Um, and it's something that's always fascinated me since since I was a kid. This this way of how vision, um, how we see isn't actually the physical environment, but it's a combination of the physical environment and, and our memory. So by the time we think we know something in terms of what we are seeing, the, the brain has already done all this work. And a lot of this work around presenting images to us is, is done unconsciously. So the, the, and the way that we're able to see is actually feel through our memory, uh, as well as kind of what we're, we're taking in from a, a physical standpoint. And I, when I was young, I was always fascinated by this idea of how if I was looking at an object and I covered one eye and, and then I looked at that same object and covered the other eye while uncovering the first eye that I covered, it, the, the object would, would seem to move. The object would almost animate and jump, even if it was uh, staying still. And I think that was kind of one of the first fascinations around seeing that that I had. And I'm not sure when this happened, but I'm pretty sure I was pre-verbal where I, I was just fascinated by this phenomenon. I didn't understand, of course, that what I was doing was kind of, you know, experiencing vision for the first time and kind of having having this sensation of, kind of wonder around, you know, how, how we see as humans and how, you know, we have this wonderful ability to see with both of our eyes to kind of widen our perspective. And I think of that not only in a physical sense, but in a conceptual sense as well. So um, I think about images as tools to help us kind of help me widen my perspective in a way. And I think that's really kind of the focus uh, of my work. And I, I have these images here. It's kind of like these are some of the first images. Um, this is this is an image from Soul Train. This is an image from the freeway in Los Angeles. I was born in Los Angeles. I'm, this is you know these are some of the first things I, I saw in my life. I was raised in a place called Tulare, which is Central California. Um, I was there because my family were farm workers that moved to Tulare, uh, Central California. You know, in in the early 20th century you know, to, to do farm work. And this is kind of, these are the, the scenes of, of that area, you know, these kind of flatlands. Um, I, I grew up there when the agricultural industry was shifting to being more mechanized. And a lot of these farms were becoming uh, de de demolished or, or becoming useless. And, and the land is kind of like that. This is a this is an image from a show called Snowfall that's based on South Central Los Angeles uh, of the 80s and 90s. Um, created, the show was created by John Singleton. Uh, shout out to, to John Singleton for creating the work that he did. But this is kind of an image that is representative of images that I saw, you know, growing up. This is an image from Tulare, California, where, again, where I grew up and it's you know, the claim to fame in, in this rural community is, has a largest farm show, the largest agricultural <laughs> expo in the country. So this is a shot of that, of that expo. You know, this is a shot of a park that was near where I grew up. You know, where I grew up was close to the Sierra Nevada foothills. And, and these trees are some of the largest and oldest trees in, in the world. And this is a grove of those oak trees that was preserved as a park. 
This is a, a place in Central California called Allentown. Um, Allentown in Central California, it's an interesting place in that there are many sundown towns, meaning black people could not sleep there. So there's a town called Allentown that was an all black town that was in Tulare County, close to where I grew up. Um, and this is kind of, uh, you know, it's a historic park now, but this is a, you know, representative of the Central Valley where I grew up in the community that, that I grew up within. Um, this is another shot from Tulare. Uh, you know, so I'm just kind of, this is uh, Florence and Normandy, um, a corner in Los Angeles. This is a, a photographer. Bohoro, but uh, I'm pronouncing his his last name incorrectly, but it's B O R O Q U E Z is his last name. He's a great photographer in Los Angeles who does a lot of street photography, capturing the images of the 80s and, and, and 90s. This is a scene from the Los Angeles rebellion that happened in, in the 90s after the Rodney King verdict. Um, so th this is kind of showing what my visual memory um, is influenced by and the images I saw. This is an image from Gordon Parks, who's capturing, um, uh, this is the Missionary Baptist Church. These are worshipers, obviously. So this is, uh, again, I wasn't raised in the Black church, but there was this aspect of religion that, and, and belief that, that was highly influential into how I saw things. So uh, these are these are images that are kind of like, I think, capturing... More like the the day to day. These are these aren't posed. These are these are images that are kind of displaying or an experience that I had, you know, growing up to in a sense, and that shaped my my visual world. Next, I'm going into images that are intentional. While well, this Gordon Parks image is obviously in, in in some of the other photography is intentional image creation, but it, it was kind of capturing a moment. These are images that are, you know, intentionally made to kind of convey um, a specific perspective. This is a, a famous image. This image was actually taken in, in the Central Valley um, where I grew up. And this is a striking image. A lot of these images I included because these are images that influenced me in that I knew that these images meant something. I knew that these images had weight. And here, you know, it's kind of documentation of, you know, this was taken, when was this? I forget exactly when this image was taken, but this image was taken at a time when there was a lot of um, transition and and the name of this image is Migrant Mother. And, and this is um, someone who was moving from Oklahoma to, to California to work. And, you know, this is representative of, uh, of poverty. I think a lot of people see that when when they see this image, but there's also, you know, motherhood and strength and these other things that, that come to mind when seeing this image. This is uh, Ernie Barnes, The Sugar Shack, which is an image that I always knew as the Good Times <laughs> painting because it came on, this image was shown as, as the show Good Times uh, show. And that's when I first saw this. And that's when I, this was one of the, the first images in terms of an image that I knew someone made that seemed to convey an interesting environment, maybe a place where, where I wanted to be or a place where people wanted to be. And I found it extremely compelling and something that I, I know influenced my, my work. Um, this is an image from a painting from Paul Gauguin. I included this because this is one of the painters that I saw you know, growing up in Tulare, there wasn't a lot of, I didn't have a ton of exposure to, you know, going to museums and things like that, but I did have a chance to to go to DC when I was young. And there happened to be a Gauguin exhibit at the Smithsonian and I saw these paintings and something really struck me with these with these images and and they stayed with me over time. Um, definitely around the, the, the figures and kind of how they interacted with each other and how the environment was depicted. Jacob Lawrence is another painter that I was introduced to through a calendar. My mother had a calendar that was uh, J Jacob Lawrence Prince. And I I kept that calendar actually uh, beyond the year that it was useful and um, would just stare at these images. And, it, you know, again, these are some of the early images that, that made me think about how people made images. And I was constantly drawing at this time anyway. So it, it just was natural for me to flock toward these types of images. I was doing things like, you know, drawing animals and attempting to copy comic book characters and things like that. But, you know, the, the idea of creating an image that's, you know, lasting and powerful and says something and conveys something beyond just the, the lines and the, the colors that are used to create the image 
is something that I became aware of, you know, looking at some of these types of works. When I went to college at, at UC Berkeley, I studied architecture and I was introduced to some of these, you know, kind of more formal thinking around image making, place making, space creation. Piet Mondrian is someone who we we studied in architecture school and it, it resonated with me in that, you know, these, these primary colors and simple shapes were able to kind of have this continued discussion over time so that even though this, even though there are several pieces that have this same language and same palette and construction, each piece was still distinct in that the, the combinations of those shapes and colors made each piece have an, a narrative on its own. And I thought that was quite interesting in terms of, you know, making place, in terms of telling a story with kind of almost crude or simple lines. In architecture school, you know, again, some of the, what I'm showing is highly like Western centric. Uh, this is, you know, the the environment that I was trained in from an architecture perspective, of course, like the Vitruvian man, this kind of like almost ideal proportion. But it, I, I included this because this is one of the, these images that made me think about a person in terms of how they take up space. And it made me kind of think about more about individuals, you know, within their environment, not only within their social environment, but within kind of their their actual physical environment and how someone kind of takes up space in in that manner and and how um, kind of considering those proportions could be telling in terms of creating space for those proportions. Um, And it also made me think about this idea of kind of documenting the body and and thinking about the body within space was something that I was attracted to in terms of, you know, being someone at this, at this time when I was in architecture school, I was very interested in both the art and science of, of, of the experience, you know, and that's something that fascinated me about makers, image makers like Man Ray. This is, this is an image from Man Ray. And, you know, here it's, the, the thing that I find compelling with this image and other images that Man Ray created is that they were very, it, it's very, you know, from the surreal standpoint of like, hey, what am I actually looking at? You know, and the, and the viewer has to ask that question and, and they either have to have an answer to that question or not. Um, and that's an interesting prompt. You know, it's an interesting way to experience our environment is kind of asking these questions, you know, what am I looking at? Why do I see it this way? Going back to those early questions that I had about about vision itself and how vision functioned. I like this piece because, okay, this is 1920. It's a lampshade. Obviously, you know, he's thinking about what's outside of, of this space and what's within this space. He's He's kind of questioning what is a lampshade? How can one consider what a, a lampshade is? You know, and this is kind of an interesting question, in that we can ask this question about other things in our lives, right? You know, why is this system a system that exists in this manner? Can this system, whether it's a, a you know, how light is produced from a, electricity and displayed or constrained through a shade, how, you know, how can that system be different with? sort of different constraints or how can the product of that system be different with different constraints so these these are kind of you know very very large thoughts that are kind of you know put front and center um, with an object and I, I found that fascinating um, I was also introduced to William de Kooning in an undergrad you know just understanding that there are many ways to convey a image and convey a experience and this is in you know i always found why you know like like a lot of folks of course they find these these works the the woman series that that de kooning did you know fascinating due to it's kind of you know the vibrant and the line work and the variance and the line weight the palette the the kind of crude representation but also this this subtle beauty and poetry in a way around how the body is existing within space kind of calling back to some of those you know the 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 Vitruvian image I I showed Uh, these are the kinds of things that I was introduced to in architecture school that greatly influenced what I was doing in terms of the the drawing and and image making 
And I would have to say that in terms of me making images, just to kind of um, layer that into, into this part of things, like me making images has been a very compulsive practice. Like I, I'm always drawing and sketching as long as there's a, a pen in front of me. And even if not, I often have an urge to find a pen or a pencil and kind of begin sketching. So when I see something like this, that where the, the actual line work is displayed in the, the finished work, I found this, you know, extremely exhilarating almost in that I I could see the energy of the the person who made the work like in the painting as an artifact. You know, this this is something that, you know, the object or or subject of this work is maybe they're posed, maybe they're there, maybe not. You know, maybe this is just uh, sort of a visceral output from from de Kooning. And I thought, you know, this is similar to, to things at, at the time. You know, of course, this is from 1953. But when at the time I saw this work for the first time, I was probably, you know, more interested in things like graffiti and things like that, as far as images that I noticed in, in the world or in images that were compelling to me. And I found that this was kind of along those lines in terms of really kind of seeing a person put their own unique imprint in the canvas, in the work it, itself. Um, I, I found that, you know, fascinating. I was also introduced to Diebenkorn and I thought these works were, you know, fascinating to me because of how, you know, there there was a, a use of almost, yeah, for sure, like abstraction and kind of flattening spaces and kind of thinking about things like through a physics lens. It's like, okay, you're, you're, you're flattening, space and 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 in that way you're bending time in a way these these kind of like flattening time capsules that that he created that look you know um you know looking at this you it might seem only abstract but looking closer we see what, what's going on and there actually is depth but then there's you know a question of maybe that's that's just my perception now and maybe at another time it, it could change and and become flat again. So it's like this fungibility of an image was like fascinating to me. And I thought that the way that, you know, Demon Corn kind of put these these landscapes in this abstract manner, you know, it, it was a, a special kind of treatment of the land itself um, and almost a weird like way of respecting a space and documenting it in this careful manner. So those are some of the images that that really intrigued me in terms of painting you know, I was also introduced to Romero Bearden, not through my study of architecture, but through my study of the Harlem Renaissance and the work that came out of that. You know, I was I was also, you know, one of the other things that kind of drove my interest in, you know, learning and kind of propelled me to go to college and things like that. We're kind of thinking about these makers of that time, like the Harlem Renaissance, like, you know, it was always in, being in Tulare, you know, which is like, a uh, place where it's like 6% Black or something like that in terms of the demographics. You know, the this idea of uh, a place where people were kind of sharpened by each other's practice of of making and, and thinking and kind of being critical about things um, was, you know, super interesting to me. And uh, Romare Bearden had this way of kind of putting objects together in this manner that gave kind of uh, something old and new life or or something that was kind of uh, discarded prominence and kind of promoted these figures or or these lives that that seemed left behind in a way. And I thought that statement was beautiful and compelling and and made me think about making images and kind of contributing to, to this practice of image making. Later on, you know, I, I started, you know, being more structured about going to museums and and thinking about paintings. And these are some of the images that kind of came across my purview that that really struck me in terms of thinking about the body and space and, and kind of, you know, maybe an internal struggles and kind of these visceral experiences. This is an image from Vivian Meyer, you know, amazing photographer. Again, kind of thinking about humans in this way that's very careful and considered, even though the subjects in front of us are like very blurred. There's, there's also this movement that that I see with them. Um, I see, you know, uh, sort of. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, you know, very kind of almost specific 
having a specific interaction with, with both of these figures that are in the foreground. And of course, it's it's juxtaposed with the images that who are, you know, across the street. So of course, I'm thinking about, you know, power dynamics there. It looks like they're in Wall Street or something like that. So, you know, these are all things that come to mind with only just this this one image with, with the flag, et cetera. So I, there's all these things, these symbols that, that come into play that intersect that, you know, produce this this image that's that's a moment that means so much more than that brief moment in time. This is an image from the film Moonlight. You know that that movie was very inspirational, and it was uh, a, 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 a film that made me think differently about Miami. Actually, it made me realize like the type of you know high quality art thinking and, and work that was coming out of Miami, and made me think to look at one of the things that, that made me think about looking at, at Miami as a place to make art. This is another image from, you know, this is Arthur Jaffra, Loves the Message, The Message is Death. This is uh, just a, a still from that film, which is a, uh, a beautiful film that, you know, documents life in a way that is, is very compelling and, and makes me think about images, you know, and, and this, you know, visceral experience through image making. Uh, Marlene Dumas, a, another artist that, that I learned about whose work fascinated me in that it would really kind of played with these ideas of, you know, what, what am I seeing is what, what's happening in this image? You know, uh, why is this image even compelling? You know, is this, is this a, a, a wig? Obviously this, maybe um, a person is sitting for this, maybe, maybe not, maybe this, you know, when I see this, it could be, you know, multiple people perhaps composed over time. So it's just, you know, different things like that make me kind of, you know, have these questions. Noah Davis is another painter that's high, highly influential also um, from Los Angeles who, you know, created these works that have, you know, these, this quality of people kind of uh, blending into their environment, blending into each other, blending into space. And then these are some of some of my sketches. So um, as again, as I mentioned, I'm always I'm always sketching. This is you know kind of a snapshot of of I think this was paper that covered a table in, in my studio. So it you know nothing that I should exhibit or anything like that, but just kind of showing the the line work and and kind of how I draw. And these are all of course like these are imagined imagined portraits, imagined images. And this this is a pastel on paper. These are this is a small. These are small sketches. Um, it's like a woman and a child. I'm not sure if this was done from. Yeah, I think this was done from memory. You know, I I, I travel a lot, so I see certain gestures and and I think about them over time, and and then you know capture them in these in in these sketches. And when I'm when I initiate these drawings, you can see the line work. It's very abstract. I'm mostly kind of scribbling until these images occur. And sometimes I'm I'm sketching and then thinking about the day or the, the day before and these images kind of uh, arrive. And then I, I, I'm able to kind of resurrect them from my, my memory and kind of make these works um, or imagine environments. You know, this is something as a sketch I was working on thinking about a painting actually that I haven't, <laughs> that I haven't done, but it's, you know, to a painting about two people like going fishing or something like that. So I, you know, it, it's, it's kind of mundane, but you know, these aspects of labor and, and, working and being in the environment. These are things that are kind of embedded in, in my visual memory from, from the past. And I, I kind of think about these things often when I, when I see them and, and, you know, make these sketches. Yeah. These are sketches from my, my sketchbook. It's another pastel. And then, so I'll go to, I'll go to um, some paintings here. So this painting is called choosing to transcend because the options were a rotting from the inside or b rotting from the outside i think the title is, is uh something like that but this was in my my first solo show with spinello this is watercolor on paper like all of my work it started out very abstract with watercolor marks and then grew into these three figures so you know this this is kind of showing you know i think when i make work, I'm always thinking about, you know, how people relate to each other, how they relate to their environment and sort of the, the how, you know, the transitions of, of individuals. So whether people are moving in time as a person or maybe moving through space as, as an idea, you know, how can I portray this as, as an image, you know? So this is another uh, image that was in, this was my second 
a solo show with the gallery. This is a large work, like 90, it's basically like eight feet tall, um, six or seven feet wide, something like that. Um, something as elusive as music, non-primitive or beyond time. So the this second show was really about kind of this idea of performance. The show happened in 2020. And this work in particular came after a conversation I had with a friend of mine who was talking about, you know, some uh, a, a news a moment in the news where someone was shot by police and and they were kind of critiquing the the person's behavior you know before you know it was an unarmed person who was was shot by police and they were, my friend was critiquing their behavior before they were shot as to that being the reason why they were shot and it just made me think about how as people we often are you know evaluated to our, our performance is evaluated to almost a ridiculous degree such that someone would have a, a criticism of, of um, how someone is choosing to or or experiencing being assaulted by police and so this title comes from a review or a set of reviews of a a dancer and it, it, you know this is Josephine Baker was was the dancer and this is a reviewer kind of thinking of this person as as primitive or beyond time or or not real so that you know the their performance is abstracted from their actual life and this is kind of what what happens i i, I find in in certain situations where based on individual status we're we're able to kind of think about them as as not humans but as objects and and this uh, this work in particular was was about this dance or this kind of um, necessity of, of navigating this dynamic wherein the performance is evaluated to an extreme degree. Um, this is purified in the name of, of the gun and the, the fermented spirits. I didn't have the whole title in there, but this, this image, you know, I was creating this um, image and I, I was thinking about you know, some of the first Africans who were Christianized and how um, some of the, these individuals took that that status that you know, of, of being um, close to the Portuguese through religion to then basically, you know, establish power structures over their fellow Africans. So this was kind of a, a documentation of, of that, uh, you know, thinking about this baptism or these series of, of baptisms that introduced this this religion to the continent and thereby introducing the transatlantic slave trade and, and um, international labor project that we currently are kind of experiencing the results of to this day. So this is a detail of this. And we're kind of seeing some of the, you know, how, how I use colors and, and um, abstract mark making to construct these paintings. This is oil on canvas paper. Um, this image is called They Became the Depth Between Them. And this is kind of a documentation of people sharing space in, in nature and kind of almost becoming the environment and becoming the the sea that's that's between them. And the sea here is is not, you know, they're not actually, you know, it's I I, I was the title came from kind of thinking about this <laughs> this this depth be, between them and, and that the sea, while it's it's between them, maybe their relationship is as as deep as as a sea could be because of spending and sharing this this time. This is called Orchestration of Realms. This is a, a work that I created. Actually, I think this came from seeing kids play on, on my way to the studio. I ride my, I, I frequently, I ride my bike to the studio, which is in Alapata. I live in Miami Beach. And in that, I, I see a lot, gives me a lot of ideas to kind of structure my work sometimes. And this is one of these these images that just made me think of how, how children are able to create their own world. And there's there's this kind of orchestration that takes place that's you know very, very interesting. And if you know when observed, we find how truly creative we can be and how children are kind of this very true expression of that can be a very true expression of that of that creativity in the realms that they create and orchestrate, you know, so intricately at times. This was also a large work. This piece I forgot to mention is also very large, like 10, this is like 10 feet tall, maybe, or nine feet tall by 10 or, or 13 feet wide. So, you know, I'm just kind of showing the, the difference in scale with some of these pieces. Like these sketches, for instance, are just, are very, you know, very small, the five inches. Um, 
and something like that. Whereas these are, you know, some of these are, are very large. Um, this was some, somebody said something about a penthouse party. You know, this is, this is a word just kind of thinking about this dynamic of, of two people that, that end up at a party, you know, uh, and using that idea to kind of structure this setting. But in this, I'm still kind of thinking about the outside environment and, and how these two are, you know, exalted in a way and, and um, looking down on the, on the sky even. And that's kind of, you know, an interesting, interesting idea. This work was in my second show with the gallery called Carrying the Scalps of White Men in Liquor Store Bags During Prohibition Era 2. So I created two of these. Uh, this is kind of a two-part two painting series, if you will. And here it's like, you know, I was on this kind of, again, this work was created in 2020 during the summer when there's, you know, a lot going on in in terms of our social environment. There's the post George Floyd reactions. And there's also more incidents of police abuse documented and, and kind of displayed regularly through, through the internet and through television. And it kind of put those dynamics put me on this thought experiment around, you know, my, you know, my great grandparents, even, you know, a hundred years ago, if, if uh, these folks could see how, you know, we're experiencing some of the same things that they experienced in, in this country. So this carrying scalps of, of white men and, and liquor store bags is like the result of this thought experiment of like, if my ancestors could come to the future and see what's happening in liquor stores and, and take a memento from a, a 2020, you know, liquor store and take it back to the past and, and do something that's ahistorical in terms of black men or, or native men selling scalps of white men. That's something that didn't happen, but that did happen, of course, to, to native populations in this country. But maybe would would that have changed the outcome of what happened to the the offspring of those people in 2020? So I mean, this is like this this sort of convoluted narrative, but these ahistorical narratives are things that could arrive when when using you know one's imagination to kind of guide the work um, and also think about systems and think critically about about situations. This work I uh, showed recently at at the Armory Fair. This is called "From a Hum to a Scream." loud enough to be the only sound. And this is, you know, thinking about someone playing the piano. I I had a lot of piano players in in my family. And and this is a painting about someone in this casual moment of like, basically like needing to play the piano, needing to kind of get this song out, you know, starting quietly and then ending loudly and and without a shirt and kind of giving his all to to the work. And and this is, you know, uh, kind of documentation of of that idea. This is uh, another version are the the other work in that series. Um, so this, I included these because it's kind of interesting in that these two works like show how I think about space. Like this is, I, even though I don't, I never practice architecture, I still think about space in this, in this way, a lot of times thinking about things in like plan and, and elevation. And this is, you know, one view of, of this same scene, you know, essentially if, if someone was um, standing to the right of, of this image and, and, viewed these two on their horses, you know, perhaps it would, it would look, you know, something like this. Um, so this is kind of, you know, how I think about painting and, and construct these environments. This work is called To Be As A Cloud. So I'm thinking about, you know, a person in space and how they are actually shaping the space and space is shaping them, you know, kind of back to kind of thinking about Mondrian and how there's, you know, these, these lines that are, almost suggestions at some points and color is filling in the rest of, of the space and, and the eye wonders and then wonders, hey, what is the figure? What is the ground? Where does this figure stop? Where where does the environment begin? And kind of using that as a way to, to lift this person up and kind of give a exalted, again, I'll use that word, um, view of, of this person. This work is called Lime and, and Sunshine. The title is, uh, it's a play on words, Lime, you know, used as a kind of slang used to mean like hang out. And this is obviously like a lime garment. I'm thinking about this person in, in the sunshine, you know, um, so it's kind of this person who's like taking up the sun, taking up space and, and uh, enjoying her, herself doing that. This work is called Unk and his natural halo. Um, again, that that title is a play on words about the the hairstyle, and um, but you know, still kind of there's this 
prompting of, you know, how this person is sitting in space, you know, where is the environment? How is the environment influencing this person? You know, what is, is happening here? What is this room? Is this a room? You know, these are these are questions that that come up that the viewer has to engage. Um, but in the work, you know, I'm I'm kind of using these geometries that I'm super interested in in terms of like how the, the arms are, are placed uh, as well as the hands and kind of this way of, of, of body language communicating an individual, you know, in, in space or communicating how an individual presents themselves in space. So now this is kind of work that I've done, you know, very recently. I created this series recently about kind of people who do work with, with fire. And this is one of the the works that was in that series. This is a large, another large piece. This is in a collection of the Orlando Museum of Art. The, it's called Increasing the, the Odds by Trying. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I, I wrote kind of a short essay about this painting, but I mean, at, the, at the end of the day, this is, you know, about people who are kind of, like, almost like that painting, the orchestration of realms. It's like these people who are um, the idea is that they're they're shooting dice, they're in a dice game, and you know they're creating their own environment in in doing that. They're creating their their own odds. They're creating their own space. In that way, they're creating a hierarchy that that doesn't um, or that is parallel to or within the the hierarchies that that they're um, existing within society at large. And by creating this this game. Not only are they creating their their own space and their own situation and their own rules in a way that is you know also reflective of of how individuals are doing the same thing in, in the game of life in in general in terms of you know assessing risk, making decisions based on those assessments, and kind of living with those decisions. So this is work that's in the studio now, these are paintings that are that are in progress, um, untitled, um, just kind of showing the, the practice. These are three judges. There's, you know, definitely commentary here. I think a lot of my work, you see there's there's the threads of, of um, mundane, but there, there's also threads of comments on, on social situations. And this is, this is one of those. Um, this I included to just kind of show how I think about landscape and the body as landscape this is a sketch this is just you know watercolor sketch but i wanted to you know this looks like we have a image of of a reclining nude with a picture in a picture which i did almost as like a yeah i just think it's funny sometimes to have painting pictures of of paintings or pictures in paintings and then this is like a painting within a picture window but maybe that's a painting, you know, so it's like kind of thinking about the work in this way. But I also chose to include this because this shows like how I think about the body as as a landscape. And even with, you know, simple color and line, we can kind of break that down. Like if one was to just take this image, zoom in, you know, maybe this does look like a, a landscape, like maybe hills and, and foliage or, or something like that, you know, with, with water. And then there, here's you know, the actual landscape behind the sketch. And then here's, you know, the, the work again all, all together. So I think, you know, my work is is layered in that way of I'm making these deliberate choices around, you know, how people are using space and kind of thinking about how we are our, our environment in a way and how our environment kind of creates us as people. And there's, there's ways to kind of shape our environment deliberately. I'm doing so, of course, in, in painting, but there's there's ways to go beyond that. And this is a work in the studio. And this is called Keeping My Brother While Standing on Ground That Was Made Sacred the Hard Way. So this is, you know, about a, a bond, uh, somewhat of a, a bond of, of brotherhood and, and two people kind of, you know, sharing time on what I envision as like concrete steps. But there's this kind of openness to the painting and uh, to to make one wonder like what is in in front of them and also as the viewer behind them what you know what's behind them as well so these are kind of um some of the things that i think about in the work and i think yeah that's actually it for the images okay wow <laughs> That was that was amazing. It it made me think about how your title um, and imagination 
I had been hearing, thinking about it in terms of your imagination, but it's the viewer's imagination just as much. Um, I hadn't seen your work until the last two years, but I've been I've seen other work by black artists, um, and I'm thinking mostly of Henry Taylor and James Carey Marshall, who are also portraying in paint black people living black lives in society in the same situations that white people are just living their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think you're very much part of that conversation as well. Um, For sure. And uh, you've, you've, you've um, brought that kind of pride and, and, and just living sense uh, to the black community and every other community and increased our vision and understanding um, as good art does. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I thank you very much for, for tonight. Um, I think we all do. And um, I think we'll say good night now. Yes. All right. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.